looking forward to his talk today. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our president today as well, Shane Griffin. How are you, Shane? Hey, Rebecca, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for all of your efforts to help me put this together. Uh, you're right, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to hearing from Dr. Schmidt today. He's got some great content. If you missed him on the pivot with John Carroll uh, last week, that video is up on the website and the YouTube channel, but uh, he's got some great illustrations here today. So we are uh, really looking forward to hearing from, uh, from Dr. Schmidt. But again, Rebecca, great to see you. Uh, thanks for your efforts today. Uh, before we get started, I want to welcome in Mr. John Carroll to uh, kick us off with the invocation and the pledge. John? Thanks, Shane. There's a story of a visiting pastor who attended a men's breakfast in the middle of a rural farming area. The group had asked an older, older farmer decked out in bib overalls to say grace for the meal. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer said. The visiting pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer and wonder where this was going. Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing a little concerned. And Lord, you know I don't much care for raw white flour. The pastor glanced again and noticed he wasn't the only one feeling uncomfortable in the room. Then the farmer said, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you are done mixing. It will probably be even better than biscuits. Amen. So Lord God and Father, we ask, for your blessings and your strength through this time of challenge. We ask, Lord, for patience for ourselves, understanding and expecting that what comes out on the other end, even though we may have to wait a while, uh, could be better than biscuits. We make these prayers in your precious name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, John. Appreciate all of your efforts, and thank you for being a, a valued board member and a valued member of the Mount Pleasant uh, Chamber of Commerce. Again, I'd like to welcome everybody today to our second ever uh, virtual luncheon. Uh, the first one went off without a hitch. So uh, hopefully today we'll go uh, just as smooth again. We're very excited for the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Michael Schmidt uh, delivering remarks uh, today. I do have some opening comments that I'd like to uh, communicate with you. Um, we thank you first of all for your patience during this time. Uh, obviously we have not been able to get together in person. We are doing a lot of events virtually, which I hope we're able to take advantage of. But uh, we are working diligently and we are talking as a board on a regular basis about meeting in person again. When that might be, uh, we don't know for sure. We have talked about doing some small outdoor events, maybe a coffee or a happy hour, possibly late August, maybe early September. So I want to at least let you know that we are talking about these things and we do want to get everybody back together because there is power, obviously, in that human interaction and that human connection and in-person networking. But at the end of the day, the last thing we want to do is put uh, you in danger. We don't want anybody to be sick, and we don't want to put our organization uh, in a bad light uh, as well. So that's kind of uh, where we are right now in regards to uh, our events uh, in person. I understand I've got some uh, some audio uh, issues here. Hopefully, uh, those will uh, those will ease up as we move through the uh, the presentation. Um, so I think yeah. I think we're, we're smoothing out now. So apologies uh, for the, for the uh, technical issues uh, on our end here. Continuing on with, uh, with my remarks, uh, we are at the halfway point. Unbelievably, 2020, I know at times it feels like uh, this year has taken on a whole new meaning and has taken 
a lot longer to complete, but we are uh, about uh, halfway through. And wanted to let you know that your chamber uh, is in very good standing when it comes to finances. We are strong financially despite uh, the COVID-19 situation. So there's no need to worry about where we stand from a financial standpoint. Our treasurer does a very good job of making sure uh, that we, uh, we stay positive and uh, he is doing a great job of communicating to the board uh, as well. So um, just want to let you know that we are on a very strong financial uh, footing. Also too, the membership continues to increase and Sarah and Ben are going to talk about this later uh, in the meeting. We're very excited to, to let you know that we've, we've added about 18 or 19 new members since the beginning of COVID-19. So there are new people that are seeing the value in what we are delivering as a chamber and uh, like I said, 18 to 19 or 20 new members, something like that, uh, since COVID started. So we're very excited about that. Right now, uh, we are sitting at about 430-ish members. And again, Sarah will have a more detailed membership update coming up in the meeting. But we're very excited about the growth of the organization, despite the challenges you know, that we have with, uh, with COVID-19. So that's kind of about halfway where we are uh, as far as a, a chamber. Uh, a couple of uh, upcoming events. If you want to check out our event calendar, you can visit our website. It's mountpleasantchamber.org, mountpleasantchamber.org. We do have a couple of events coming up. These will be virtual, obviously. Our next one is uh, June 23rd. This will be a before nine coffee at the Spring Hill Suites uh, by Marriott, uh, presented by uh, that great uh, hotel. And we thank uh, Jennifer Maxwell for setting that up. And we thank Spring Hill Suites. For, uh, for putting that together for us. That will be a virtual before nine. And then Wednesday on July the 8th, it's an after hours virtual presented by Summerby at Mount Pleasant. So again, we continue to do a number of webinars. We continue to do a number of virtual events. All you need to do is visit the website, mountpleasantchamber.org to uh, visit the calendar of events page and also to page down to the bottom of the Coronavirus Resource Center page to see all of the webinars uh, that we have done uh, in the past. Uh, other uh, alerts I want to make you aware of, I just mentioned the Coronavirus Resource Center page, a lot of webinars there. You can also visit us at the YouTube. At YouTube, we have our own channel. There are two Mount Pleasant Chamber uh, channels, but if you'll just visit the one that has the most videos, that is the correct one. So visit YouTube and check out all of our uh, webinars there as well. We have a number of we have a number of um, members that have posted offers and updates to the Coronavirus Resource Center page. So just visit that page and you'll see 50 plus offers and updates submitted by uh, members, whether it's a percentage discount off or whether it's about the changing of hours, whatever the case may be. There are a lot of members that have a number of offers, discounts and, and updates there on the page uh, as well. Also too, if you're looking for a job or if you know of someone that's looking for a job or if you'd like to post a job, we have a job postings page uh, as well at the website. So again, just visit mountpleasantchamber.org. Everything uh, is right there. The Coronavirus Resource Center page is continually updated. Uh, myself, Rebecca, Tamara, Amanda, Kim, uh, kind of working in the background to make sure that you have the information that you need when it comes to the coronavirus uh, and, and all the resources that are available to you. At this time, I'd like to uh, thank my board. Again, as I've said before, this is a uh, Save Tamara and Rebecca. This is a volunteer organization. These folks uh, are in these positions because they love the organization and they're volunteering their time and their talents and we're grateful to them. Obviously, my name is Shane Griffin. I'm the president of the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. I work with News Radio 94.3 WSE and iHeartMedia here in Charleston. Uh, my vice president, first my president-elect is uh, Eddie Phipps. Uh, Eddie will become our new president in 2021. My vice president is Jennifer Maxwell. Of course, our president emeritus is uh, Mr. Chris Dobbs. And obviously this organization would not be where it is today without the, uh, the help of Chris and all the things that he did to kind of get us off the ground and running as a Chamber of Commerce. We're grateful to Chris for his efforts. The secretary is Kathy Herman. Our treasurer, as I mentioned before, is Joe Hinsky, and our board members are John Carroll and Brian Sherman. Both John and Brian are two of the longest running members of the organization, and we thank them very much for their time and their talents. Moving on to the committee's uh, philanthropy, Mariana Lewis, 
and the Burnett membership is Jim Knight, Sarah Wiggins, Textual Board, Michael Cochran. Uh, programs out of Chile, Nikki Wood, Strategic Partnerships is being handled right now by uh, Rebecca Imbles. And we do have a new marketing chair. Uh, his name is Mike Compton, and I will introduce him uh, a little bit later uh, in the meeting. But Mike is our new uh, marketing chair, and we're very excited to, to have him on the board. And our general counsel is uh, Andy Phipps, who, of course, is our president elect. So I hand to all of the, uh, the uh, board members and the committee chairs for their efforts and their talents and all have been done over the course of not just this year, but uh, in years past as well. I'd like to recognize at this time the uh, member spotlight uh, for July. Uh, congratulations to Aaron Bradham of uh, SMH Architecture. So Aaron, with SMH Architecture, uh, you will be contacted by a member of the membership committee and also uh, Rebecca and Tamara will reach out to you as well and talk about what that, uh, what that means. Uh, moving forward. So congratulations to Aaron. At hey, uh, Shane, I hate to interrupt you, but you're still having some audio issues. Yeah, I'm not really sure what uh, what's going on with it, that. It Let sounds me, fine uh, now. You know, it's probably, Rebecca, my large booming voice that I use at the Coliseum to get the story <laughs> fans excited. Uh, quite possibly, uh, I can I can try to dial it down a notch uh, if that's the case. Uh, do, do uh, apologize for the um, for the technology uh, issues that we're having here, but hopefully, Rebecca, this is a little bit better, and I'll try to dial down the voice uh, a little bit. So just looking over my uh, notes here, that is all that I have uh, that I wanted to uh, discuss. Again, we thank you very much for attending the, uh, the luncheon today. We are super excited to have uh, uh, Dr. Michael Schmidt to deliver some remarks and also a presentation as well. At this time, I will welcome uh, Lauren Sims from the town of Mount Pleasant and an update from the town. Hey, Lauren. Hi, Shane. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, just a couple of brief updates from the town of Mount Pleasant. Um, first is that at their June meeting, Marahanian Town Council passed two ordinances and supported businesses. They were extensions from our previous emergency ordinance one of which allows the use of temporary signs without first obtaining a permit. Uh, the second is a temporary suspension of the environmentally friendly packaging and products ordinance, otherwise known as the plastics ordinance. Um, so both of those ordinances have been extended until the June town council meeting. That day is June four, July, excuse me, July 14th. Um, so please mark that on your calendars and um, know that you've got a little bit of, of extra time um, with those two ordinances. They will be reviewed at the July Council meeting, um, so please begin to make your preparations for that. Um, also want to make sure that everyone is aware that we do have an online map for all the businesses in the town. All, it's a very simple form. All you do is fill out uh, the services that you are offering right now, whether that's uh, limited indoor seating, limited indoor operations, expanded outdoor operations, whatever the case may be, and perhaps it's changing. It's very simple to change um, your listing on our map as well, but we do push that information out to the community. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that resource. Um, also, just a brief reminder that we are in hurricane season, um, having already had a tropical storm um, this year. So just want to remind everyone that as we have all been um, absorbed into COVID world, you also need to be thinking about your hurricane plans and what that would look like in a, a post COVID world. Um, from the town standpoint, we are putting together some information and some guidance for businesses as you make those plans. Uh, but please go ahead and, and be thinking about that, be thinking about your staffing and your operations um, should we have to deal with a storm um, this season. So um, please continue to check our website. Our resource portal is constantly updated with new information as it becomes available. Um, so we hope that you will use that resource. And if you haven't joined us already, I invite you to join us every Monday at 3.30 with um, Shane and Mayor Haney, who um, takes on uh, questions from the Chamber of Commerce and provides updates from the One Region Strategy. Um, so it's a great time to have direct contact with your mayor, ask questions, uh, get some answers that you are looking for. So if you haven't joined us already, we look forward to seeing you every Monday at 3.30. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Shane. Lauren, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your time and we are grateful for the uh, partnership with uh, the town of Mount Pleasant. Rebecca, if I could- Hi, um, Shane, it's Rebecca. Your audio is very low. Okay, well, I, I, I changed the settings. Huh. How's this? 
That sound much better there? Not really. That does not sound better there. All right, well, give me a second and I will. Yeah, I turned my settings down a bit because I thought possibly the, uh, as loud as I was, that was a problem. So how does this sound right here? Does that sound better? I'll give you a live television, right? <laughs> can, can you hear me okay now? I can hear you fine. You're a little low, but I can hear you. All right, well, I can take care of that. So, uh, Rebecca, thank you for helping out in the background, and we appreciate you letting me know about that. If we want to move along in the slides to the uh, Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce Expo uh, slide, wanted to uh, run through Michael Cochran's uh, notes. Unfortunately, Michael cannot be with us today. But as you see there on the screen, 33 businesses have reserved booths. We are still in the process of figuring out exactly what we want to do in regards to the expo. Many of you may not know, but uh, the expo that was scheduled for North Charleston in July, uh, July 16th, I believe, that was canceled as of yesterday. So North Charleston has canceled their business expo. And we are going through a couple of different options that you see there on the screen of what we want to do with our expo coming up in September. So please know that we are working on this. We are discussing it. And we will hopefully have some decision on what we're going to do in regards to the expo. Hopefully by the middle of uh, possibly end of July, and we will, we will obviously communicate that out to uh, everyone. So that's the the expo update. Uh, you can still purchase booths at this time, so just visit mountpleasantchamber.org and uh, go to the expo uh, page on the website, and you can purchase uh, a booth and or a sponsorship from there. So that's the expo update. At this time, I'll uh, welcome on Sarah Wiggins, who is the co-chair of the membership. Committee. Hey, Shane, thank you. Want to let everyone know we really appreciate our members and we'd like to welcome um, some new additions since the last meeting. Uh, Fox Pest Control, Striped Rock LLC, doing business as All About Seniors, SQ's Auto Body and Paint Shop, Charleston Dumpsters, Inc doing business as been there, dump that. The Grimes guys of Mount Pleasant too. Welcome to all of you. Also, we have a member spotlight. I'd like to share a little bit about it is Trade Bank. Um, and I'm just gonna read uh, a, a description here. Trade Bank of Charleston is the premier barter exchange company in Charleston. It is locally veteran woman owned franchise and part of one of the largest barter exchanges in the world. Trade Bank represents thousands of business owners and professionals across the US and Canada. They are an extensive network where businesses come together to trade what they have or what they need. Clients can search the internet for products and services that are offered by their other clients. Trades are conducted over the telephone with the assistance of experienced Trade Bank brokers who work closely with clients to facilitate their success. That sounds like a really wonderful organization. And then we also have a nonprofit spotlight, um, the Low Country Chaplaincy. Uh, LCC began in 2017 under the leadership and vision of Reverend Rob Dewey, who has served the Low Country for over 30 years as chaplain for 40 first responder agencies. LCC exists to offer ministry and support when life delivers hurt, disappointment, and challenging times. The chaplains are available 24 seven for individual groups or businesses who may be experiencing trauma or crisis. So another wonderful organization. Um, thanks so much, Jane. I think that's about it for membership. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. We appreciate the work that you and Ben are doing uh, in driving membership. As I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we're excited to say we've had about 18 new members since the start of uh, COVID-19. So that's uh, very, uh, very exciting news. So moving on now to Rebecca Imholtz for an update from Strategic Partnerships. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Let me get my video going here again. Sorry about that. So very excited to share the results of our second survey on topics that you want information on. At the top of the list was preparing for a second wave of COVID-19. 
We had a lot of respondents who wanted to get information on financial information related to your SBA loan. So best accounting practices rose to the top with that. Now that you've got your loan in place, what, how do you account for that to make sure you make the most of it? Cybersecurity, very hot topic right now, taking care of our mental health. And one of the topics that we are still waiting to get more guidance from the state house is liability protections during COVID-19. So we're in constant uh, touch with the state house on that, the South Carolina Chamber. As we learn more, we'll pass it on. I love the comment when someone said, I wanna put the plague behind us. I totally agree, can't come soon enough. So thank you for those responses. So some of the new webinars that we have done include Monday with the mayor. We've continued to do those. Very, very popular, talking to the Honorable Will Haney every Monday, getting the latest update from the mayor and Lauren Sims, that, who you heard from earlier today on resources and information in the town related to COVID-19. Our pivot that we've been having on Tuesdays have, um, well, we basically pivoted that. We were essentially doing pivot talks on marketing and sales, but based on the feedback that we received from you all, we focused on medical facts and updates, childcare, mental health. So thank you again for providing that feedback. So we pivoted the pivot. And uh, we're continuing to do some more webinars weekly. If you have missed them, uh, check us out on our YouTube channel or our website, and they're always there. And we're also, about every other Friday, I sit on a conference call with the South Carolina Chamber and state officials. So we're staying on top of that as well. As Shane mentioned earlier, before nine is this Tuesday. We're gonna start at 8.30 in the morning. That way, those of you who are still working from home, it gives you a chance to get your breakfast. Whether or not you change out of your pajama bottoms, that's up to you, but we're gonna start this Tuesday at 8.30. Our second, uh, maybe our third virtual before nine. They've been very popular. The host is Spring Hill Suites by Marriott Mount Pleasant. You're gonna get a little view of their hotel. And we're gonna be talking about tea. We're gonna learn all about tea with a fellow chamber member for all the tea in China. I'm really looking forward to that. So make sure you bring your favorite teapot to showcase. And we're going to talk about how you can auto renew your Mount Pleasant Chamber membership. For those of you that take advantage of that, we're going to have you qualify for a prize that we're going to give away monthly. So really looking forward to that as well. That's it for me, Shane, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for your efforts in uh, holding down the fort when it comes to strategic partnerships on top of uh, everything else that you're doing for the organization. So Rebecca is our director of development and uh, she is uh, just doing a fantastic job of helping us not only drive membership, but also to, to uh, help put events together, whether virtual or in person, uh, Rebecca has been doing a, a great job and we're happy to have her. At this time, um, I'd like to introduce first, before I hand it off to him, Mike Compton. He is our new chair of the uh, marketing uh, committee. Mike is the co-founder and executive producer of Three Chairs Productions. Before co-founding Three Chairs, uh, Mike was a communications media production uh, graduate from Michigan State University. As soon as he joined the chamber in the fall of 19, he became very active in the strategic partnerships in the marketing committee. And Mike actually uh, led our February marketing seminar with the Charleston chapter of the American Marketing Association as well as a recent chamber webinar on digital and social media marketing. In addition to being our leader uh, in the chamber, Mike is a leader with the Charleston chapter of the AMA. Mike and his wife, Grace, have twin four-year-old boys. Uh, they are a handful because when we've had some virtual calls, uh, Mike has had to uh, tell his twin boys to kind of settle down a little bit. So um, he's got a wonderful family. We are very happy to have him. He's our new marketing maven, uh, as we, uh, we could say. But uh, for the marketing update, I'll hand it off to the marketing maven, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Compton. Hey, Mike. Hey, Shane. Thanks a lot. A couple wires crossed there. My wife's name is Emily, and my dog's name is Grace. But, uh, you know, details. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing we're recording this. I'm sure I did to my wife. Yes, no, I'm kidding. Um, but, okay. no. <laughs> Thank I you. See, you know yeah. what? I, I see now it says Mike and his wife, and then it says Grace. I, I, there's no comma there, so I didn't I didn't pause That's for great. your wife and then the dog, Grace. So She'll love it. Thing. She'll love it. She's got a great sense of humor. 
Thanks for the intro, Shane. <laughs> um, I'm just a new guy in town, just trying to add value to the community and trying to make friends um, at the same time. So it's my pleasure um, to be a part of this team of the Mount Pleasant Chamber. Um, if anybody is interested in becoming uh, a committee uh, member or, you know, on, my, on my marketing team, um, please go ahead and, and reach out. I'll put my LinkedIn uh, URL in the uh, chat box there. But uh, feel free to reach out if you ever want to be a part of the team. We meet once a month, and then we have a meeting on Monday. Um, I've got a few new, new faces to, the, to the, both to the chamber and to the marketing team that um, are going to be showing up Monday as well. So we're real excited about um, getting some, some great marketing campaigns going for us. Um, so what we're doing so far, as I'm kind of jumping in here, is that we, uh, our current marketing efforts are is what you see now is we're promoting our webinars and events via social media, thanks to Social ABCs does a great job. And then we also do uh, the YouTube channel. We've got um, all the videos you see, especially the special video right here, is gonna be on the, our YouTube channel. Um, and our next meeting for the marketing team will be Monday, June 20th at 9.30 a.m. Please let me know if you wanna join our team. That's it for me, guys. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And okay. uh, give my best to your wife. My apologies. <laughs> Those kinds of things happen. It's the beauty of, uh, of live television. Uh, but yeah, we're very excited to have Mike on the team. Uh, Mike, Mike brings a, a lot of, uh, of uh, great ideas to the, uh, to the committee. So we're excited to have him uh, leading the, uh, the marketing committee and also working in concert, as you mentioned with Amanda uh, Bunting Coleman from Social ABCs. Uh, Amanda has done just a fantastic job of keeping up with our uh, YouTube channel, <clears throat> our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter. She does a great job of uh, getting all that going and making sure that we are communicating with you um, as, a, uh, as a membership group. So we thank Amanda for her efforts uh, as well. So before I hand it off to uh, Chris Dobbs, I wanted to let you know that you can submit questions to Dr. Schmidt. He will be giving a short presentation and he is uh, excited to take questions. So as he goes through the presentation, if you have a question you would like to ask, all you have to do is drop it in the chat box and he will answer that question uh, on the uh, on the luncheon here today. So again, if you have a question, just drop it in the chat box, and Dr. Schmidt will uh, will get to that question. Without further ado, to introduce our featured speaker, here is our president emeritus, Mr. Chris Stobbs. Hey, Chris. All right. Hello. Let's see if I can turn this video on. See if I can work. Okay. All right. So Dr. Schmidt is a tenured professor of microbiology and immunology with the Medical University of South Carolina. His academic focus includes pandemic flu preparations and disaster preparedness. Um, he's got controlling acquisition of hospital acquired infections is another listed uh, item he has and bacterial pathogenesis. So we're gonna be learning about a lot of the things that are very important that are going on in the world right now and going on in our community. Uh, Dr. Schmidt has spoken internationally, including uh, the TEDx talk program, um, specifically on the benefit of using copper in hospital beds to reduce the acquired infections. Um, recently, because of COVID-19, Dr. Schmidt has once again become a sought-after speaker, and his academic focus is to know how to best prepare for the pandemics and other disasters, especially big outbreaks of the flu, which would be the closest cousin to COVID-19 before the disease spread throughout the globe this year. Uh, at the end of this month, he will once again take the TEDx Charleston stage, and well, he'll be um, giving an extended conversation um, on COVID-19 issues that we're all concerned about. Uh, Dr. Schmidt earned his PhD from Indiana University and did his postdoctoral fellowship at the State University of New York in Stony Brook. So please give a warm Chamber of Commerce welcome to Dr. Schmidt. Thank you, Chris. And I'm happy to be here this morning or this afternoon, whatever time of day it is. And I'm going to share my screen so you guys can follow along with me. Make sure I pick the right screen to share and it should be sharing properly. And the question that is on everyone's mind, I think, is will things ever return to normal? So hopefully, as we walk through these slides today, um, we're gonna be able to address that question. And my good friend, John Carroll, uh, when he asked me to do the pivot last week and when he asked me to do this presentation, he said, develop for me a, a list of questions you think folks would wanna have answers to. 
And right now, since I'm sharing my screen, I can't see any of the questions that Rebecca may be posting, but I trust she'll interrupt me. And the questions you see before you are really, why are the cases rising? And here in the low country over the last few weeks, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of cases. The other question that I think everyone on planet Earth is asking is how can we prevent another shutdown? And I'll hopefully be able to address that and give us solutions of how we may be able to address that issue. And how will a second wave impact us if it occurs during flu season? I'll share with you some cool little graphics that I've developed over the years to talk about flu and especially now to talk about how flu will interact with COVID. And then finally, the questions about a vaccine and hurricane preparation become very important uh, for all of us in answering the question of how can we best protect ourselves. So in moving to the, the meta question, when will things ever return to no, normal? We need to build the effect of herd immunity, which is this complex concept that is an issue that's associated with how the virus multiplies. And the global situation as of today in this interesting infographic that the New York Times has made available, you can see the United States is at a scary statistic of about 2,163,000 individuals who have been confirmed to have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, with 117 individuals having lost their lives. And when you look up at the top in the left-hand corner, you can see that the United States is bearing a significant burden of the number of dead associated with this virus as it spreads across our globe. In the color coding of this map, you can see the hot spots rising, the red areas. We see that the red areas, again, mainland China, as many of you know, has seen a surge in its capital city of Beijing. And so consequently, they are again trying to contain the pandemic within mainland China. Similarly, we see that Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan are rising, but the United States, curiously, is holding flat. Our neighbors to the north and to the south are declining. They are seeing falling numbers. While when we look to our cousins in South and Central America, we can see it's a mixed bag. South Carolina, we have had 20,551 confirmed cases in our state. DEAC has done a tremendous job putting out information to our citizens. And you can just look at their color-coded map. And again, the key is the darker the color, the higher number of cases that are being seen. But our state has been blessed. We have only seen 617 of our citizens die from being exposed to this virus. So that's actually a bright spot for us in South Carolina. But to get back to the question, are we in the second wave? The answer is not yet. If you look, and when you look at the John Hopkins site, and in the upper left-hand corner, I have grabbed the global rate of increase in the number of viral infections. And you can see that we are still steadily climbing towards 10 million. That those initial rates that we are seeing very early in January and February and the bimodal curve distribution is how the virus is being spread. But when you graph this out and you draw the, uh, the, the lines that all our kids in high school algebra are torturing us parents with, you, you can see that it's pretty much a straight line in the wrong direction, namely it's going up. And fundamentally, three of the questions that John wants answers to 
and John, if you don't know, is a very serious taskmaster. Uh, why are cases rising? Is a second wave inevitable? And will it be a gradual wave or will it be more of a spike? And unfortunately, we don't know the answer to whether or not it will be a gradual or a spike. But what we do know is what's going on in South Carolina. And what you can see in this map that DHEC has created, it's a heat map. And of course, the red areas are where the viruses are increasing. And those red areas are really a reflection of how well the citizens of our state are behaving. Red areas mean that we are misbehaving. And as you can see in the low country, both Charleston and Myrtle Beach, we have misbehaved over the last two weeks. And it's owing to the fact that we have not been wearing our masks in public. We have not been following the recommendations of DHEC in terms of hand hygiene, making certain that as our mothers taught us when we were small children, we should wash our hands before we interact with our face or other mucous membranes, namely our nose, our mouth, uh, or our eyes. And so consequently, we need to be vigilant at wearing our masks out in public and again, following strict hand hygiene guidance to effectively prevent the spread of the virus to our friends, neighbors, and colleagues. As to why the cases are rising, it's again because everyone got cabin fever as we approach Memorial Day and we just all threw up our hands and said, enough. We have to go out, we gotta go to the beach, we gotta begin to socialize. And of course, the virus didn't care. It just reported in these red zones and we are paying the price for this now. So the issue really stems to this question, how contagious is the virus? Well, we actually don't know the answer to this question. And when I developed this slide for a briefing I gave to MUSC back in early February, uh, the CDC at the time thought they were principally large particles and that N95 masks would be sufficient to protect healthcare workers. And we weren't recommending masks for the general public owing to the fact that we were underprepared in having personal protective equipment for the general population. Of course, we have turned the manufacturing apparatus on in the United States and we're actively building uh, sufficient N95 masks for the hospitals, as well as we're building out our mask capacity so that the general public could have a mask. One of the interesting things about the virus that most folks don't know is that this virus is rather fragile. It's like a letter in a very flimsy envelope. And if you simply show a little alcohol or simply soap and water to this envelope, it will literally dissolve it. And the minute the envelope is nicked or somehow destroyed, the information set that's contained within the virus is subject to destruction. And this destruction just means that the, the nucleic acid or the message telling the virus to instruct our cells to make us feel unwell, uh, it'll effectively do that. And what you see is how this virus is spread and it's spread exponentially. And as I toggle through this slide, you can see why there has been much discuss, discussion about multiplication factors. And what we think is going on is the multiplication factor or the component that controls herd immunity, which operationally is defined when most of a population has been exposed or immune to an infectious disease, this provides an indirect protection or herd immunity to the general population. And measles, mumps, polio, chickenpox are all examples for which this was received, was achieved until recently where we had some troubles with folks not taking their measles and mumps vaccine 
And of course, the outbreaks of mumps at the College of Charleston before COVID-19 was a good example of our, our students not effectively being properly vaccinated before they showed up to school. This little graphic actually shows in a colorful way what herd immunity is about. The red individuals in the graph are the not immunized, but they are sick and contagious. And depending upon the multiplication factor, whether it be two, three, four, or five, you can see that the virus will quickly spread amongst the general population. But as we move to the middle graph, what you see is that as more people are immunized or become exposed and recovered, the yellow individuals in this particular image, you can see that the virus is no longer able to spread easily. And as more of the population becomes vaccinated through an infection, you can see that the virus has a rough time finding a host. The way pandemics work is the first wave, about 30% of the population needs to be infected. The second wave effectively takes out the second 30%. And the final wave takes out the third component of the population or the other 30% to achieve about a 90% rate of immunization or infection. And until we get a vaccine for this virus, we're not going to truly have herd immunity unless we go through the pain and suffering and death in some cases of having an infection. But there's hope. We can prevent another shutdown by looking at testing. The first test out there was a test that asked the question, if the patient or the specimen you were investigating had the message, had the message from the virus that instructed our cells whether we would become sick. Not all, not all tests are created equally. The CDC is specifically looking for three targets, and some of the others that I have in the left-hand corner of the slide show that other uh, companies and countries are using a different strategy to test. But fundamentally, you have to ask, your, ask the question, what does it ask of the patient? What advantage does the test have in helping us answer the question, can we prevent another shutdown? Clearly, one of the best tests that we can ask or administer to address the question, can we prevent another shutdown, is the serology test. Because the question it asks of the patient is, has the patient been exposed to the virus and have they recovered? But COVID is not making things easy for us in the sense that uh, individuals can be exposed to the virus and indeed recover, but they may never actually make an antibody, at least the ones that we are presently testing. So we continue to work in the lab trying to understand whether or not we can get a good serology test so that we can help folks answer the question um, whether or not we can prevent another shutdown. We effectively want to uh, be able to make certain that this virus does not find a productive host. So the next area is mask. What's all the fuss over? And this particular graphic that appeared in the journal Science actually shows that when individuals speak, those that have large booming voices like our president, uh, Shane, who was talking into his microphone, he, he was maxing it out. So his computer screen was actually being hit with a large number of particles. Some of them, if Shane were infected with the virus, would have contaminated his computer screen. And consequently, if you were in front of Shane as he was speaking in his loud outside voice, 
you would have been exposed to the virus. So the individual wearing the mask is effectively protected from inhaling the virus because the mask is effectively going to take the brunt of Shane's speaking voice. If you were talking with an inside voice, you can see that the number of particles actually hitting the individuals are minimal. And so that's why it's very important to consider using your inside voice even when you're outside, because that is how we are going to contain things. Many individuals are actually constantly shedding virus and they may not even know they are infected. This is the asymptomatic cohort. And that's because the virus is a bit peculiar in terms of when it will delay, display symptoms in an individual. The symptoms that we routinely check for are easy ones, temperature, how well you feel, whether or not you have muscle aches, or as in the case of Congressman Cunningham, who self-reported he lost all his sense of taste and smell, and he didn't think his poor wife's spaghetti was very good because he said he couldn't taste it. So, you know, we just have to continue to be good citizens and continue to wear, wear masks. If you don't like wearing masks, you have an alternative, face shields. Because what the mask is effectively doing is shielding you. It's protecting you from the acquisition of the virus from an individual who is speaking it and exposing the air that you are effectively walking through. By wearing a face shield when you're outside or inside even when you're working with others, the brunt of your speaking voice is actually going to hit the shield of the face shield and consequently contain the spread. Most of the viruses that are in the smaller range will effectively fall down and land on your clothing. So your clothing will be considered contaminated, but again, this is a wimpy virus. If you just drop your clothes into your normal laundry with soap and water and just suds away, the virus is immediately destroyed. So face shields can achieve the same goal and they have some advantages, especially for our hard of hearing friends who are used to reading lips. And so they may be able to ask folks to wear lip, to wear a face shield for them so they could watch as they speak to see how their lips are indeed moving. So how will a second wave impact us if it occurs during flu season? Well, you have to know a little bit about, let me skip this graphic and skip this. You have to know a little bit about um, the CDC. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and these are data from its website, uh, they're constantly refining the vaccine to prevent influenza. My hope and prayer this year is that everyone who is offered a flu vaccination takes it because the flu vaccine will hopefully uh, drop the number of influenza cases that we see in the United States well below their normal annual rate. And uh, the CDC prepares as many as 50 different viral types for possible vaccine production. And so there's three actions to fight the flu. And so this is what my advice to all of you is, first and foremost, get your flu shot. Secondly, uh, help stop the spread of flu viruses by again, covering your cough, following the cough etiquette that we have been following with COVID-19. And finally, if your doctor prescribes when you call them up, through your telehealth visit and you say you think you have the symptoms of influenza, and we all know the, the prime symptom of influenza is you're just simply too tired 
to text. Lethargy is typically one of the hallmark symptoms of true influenza. And if you or any of your family members are too tired to text, you need to call for one of the telehealth visits and say, I think my son or daughter has the flu because candidly, they're too tired to text. And then the doctor will prescribe an antiviral drug that is active against influenza that will shorten the course of the viral attack in that individual. So there are a number of medications out there for influenza, and they principally take advantage of this crazy structure of influenza. And what it effectively does is it blocks the release of the virus from the cells in which it's multiplying. So it effectively locks it inside our cells. And I think I have a little graphic here that's got a cute little animation showing you the process of how one of the um, common anti-flu drugs work. So we see the virus gets into our cell. The virus then releases its, its instruction set. In the case of influenza, it has a number of little pieces parts. So it's a multi-page letter, if you will. And then the virus begins to multiply. It begins to bleb out of our cell. And voila, we have a new flu virus. And so what the flu medications effectively do is they prevent this step of allowing the virus to be released from our cells. They effectively block that release. And this is what the drug oseltamivir does. And oseltamivir is made up the street in South Carolina. And uh, it effectively will prevent oseltamivir from, oseltamivir will effectively prevent it from being released. Is there hope though for a medicine for um, SARS-CoV-2? And in this particular slide, Remdesivir is the only drug out there that has any scientific evidence that it's able to inactivate um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so as you see, the virus is being shed by the individual. The naive individual picks up the virus, it's attached to our ACE2 receptor, and it comes into our cell and it immediately begins making more virus. And it's this making of more virus where remdesivir interacts with and the remdesivir prevents it from manufacturing more viral message and hence more viruses. So some of the final questions are vaccines. When will we have them available? Well, there's over 90 under development across the globe. Early safety data have been very promising. The, the vaccines have been tested have in healthy human volunteers appear to be safe. And more importantly, some of them have been demonstrating effectiveness at generating an, immunis, an immune response. Moreover, one of the early vaccines they have challenged in animals, and they fundamentally ask the question, would the vaccine prevent disease acquisition? And the answer was yes. In the macaque monkeys that they tested the vaccine in, it did indeed prevent infection. But in the last statement on this slide, I say, but wait, there may be hope. And some of you may have seen the story on CNN a few weeks ago about resurrecting the old oral polio vaccine that I personally took when I was in kindergarten. It was on a sugar cube. Yeah, there were two drops of the oral polio vaccine that was developed by Albert Sabin when he was at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Sabin was on faculty of the medical university. And what Sabin and his colleagues have appreciated is that when they vaccinated, not only did they prevent the polio 
virus from infecting us, but there was also a dramatic decrease in the no, uh, large number of other viral respiratory infections. And this observation has been repeated numerous times through the decades, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. And it's a function of the way live and attenuated vaccines work. They effectively wake up our immune systems and effectively are slap in the face or the ice bucket challenge. It's a cold bucket of water on our immune system telling us to wake up. There are viruses in the neighborhood and you need to uh, protect yourself from the virus. So finally, what if we need to evacuate for a hurricane? How can we best protect ourselves? We already know the answer to that question. The answer is masks, face shields, gloves, and simple things like alcohol, hand sanitizers, and soap and water. So as we begin to plan for the evacuation centers that um, will need to be set up as the hurricane season gets into full swing, we have to make certain that we have enough personal protective equipment for families to be able to uh, wear and use while they're in the shelter. We have to make certain that the toddlers uh, can wear face shields so they don't get frightened and again, they don't spread the virus. We need to encourage the use of gloves because it's gonna be very challenging to socially distance. And again, we can't expect everyone to be constantly decontaminating surfaces. So gloves will effectively remind us that our hands are contaminated with potential things like SARS-CoV-2. And again, when we take the gloves off, we have to remember to wash our hands, whether that be with soap or water. And if that's not available because the hurricane has knocked out power to the water distribution center, we have to make certain that we have sufficient alcohol hand sanitization stations set up with enough product to take care of the evacuees. And so that uh, effectively concludes my remarks, and I want to leave you with one thought. The only thing more contagious than a virus is hope. And that hope comes with hard work. And you guys have the power to effectively stop this virus in its tracks. And so there is hope for all of us that we are going to be able to get back to normal in a reasonable period of time. There's hope for a vaccine and the scientific community is actively looking at medications that can directly impact this virus. So I'm gonna stop there and it looks like we have a number of questions um, and a number of questions in the chat area and I'll let um, Ms. Imholt effectively tell me which ones we're gonna do first. So thank okay. you. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. That, as always, another excellent presentation. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and time. We do have some questions in the chat room. One of them is, how has COVID-19 affected local hospitals and are we ready for a second and third wave? Well, the medical university and all our sister hospitals within the MUSC family, as well as Roper, St. Francis, and all the hospitals in the Low Country began discussions very early in the, the, what was then an epidemic moving in a pandemic stage. And we began to have these discussions very early on. Some of the slides I shared with you were done in concert with my infection control colleagues at the medical university on February 5th. You know, before we even began to worry about this virus, when we only had less than a handful of cases in the United States. And so we have been planning uh, South Carolina because of the actions of the governor and the mayor in terms of 
making strategic decisions about um, turning off our economy and making us shelter in place did the trick. We didn't see uh, a large number of cases in South Carolina. And it's only now in the last few days as we have begun to misbehave, if you will, that we've seen the spike in the number of cases. And again, it's, it's our report card. We, we need to act as responsible individuals, recognizing that what we do not only affects us, but it affects our loved ones and it affects our community. And most importantly, it can have long reaching effects on our economy. As a follow up, can you share the hospitalization numbers? How has that affected local hospitals recently? The hospitalization, uh, the hospitalizations did, in fee, did indeed affect the hospitals in the sense that we stopped outpatient surgery, we stopped seeing patients, and that's slowly moving back to, to its pre-COVID environment because we relied on testing. And now if you need a procedure done, you're effectively tested before you get that procedure. So not only does it protect the healthcare team, but it also protects you, the individual, because you don't want a, medically, a medical procedure to impact your immune system while your body is busy defending itself against COVID. As to specific numbers, I don't keep those statistics in the top of my head because it's a constantly moving target. I've heard numbers, there was one point the medical university hadn't seen more than six COVID patients in a day. But given the last two weeks and the surge that we have seen because of our Memorial Day adventures, I don't know if that number actually still holds. And my fault for not doing my homework and studying the statistics. Well, that's, that's fine. I know that you're on the research side, so totally understandable. Another question, your talk during the pivot last week was about wearing socks. Why should- Oh yes, the, the <laughs> sock story. Um, that is um, an, an infection control thing. Um, if everyone remembers the Charlie Brown cartoon and the character Pigpen, as Pigpen walked through the building, he was constantly shedding dirt. Well, the human being is no different. We're constantly losing our outer layer of skin. We're in a constant state of exfoliation. And humans are effectively covered hand to foot in microbes. And effectively, the reason we wear socks is so that, at least in a medical environment, is so that as we begin to shed, whether it be bacteria, viruses, or fungi, they're not gonna end up on the floor because when you go in and begin to clean an environment, you're effectively disturbing the air and the microbes on the floor actually go into the atmosphere. And given things like COVID and other things in um, at-risk population where you're in a hospital setting. So part of infection control is we use microfiber cloths that are electrostatically charged to effectively pick the microbes off of the floor so they don't go into the air. And you're okay at home because the stuff that you're walking around in is you. But in a hospital setting or a medical setting, it's not you. It's somebody you don't even know. And if they happen to have a, a microbe that you haven't seen and developed a defense against, you can be placed at risk. And where can one buy a face shield? There are uh, a number of locations you can do it. I was looking last week on Amazon. My colleague on the infection control committee for the dental school has been looking to uh, find face shields that are comfortable to wear that extend below the chin so none of the moisture will effectively smash into the screen. 
and a Amazon has some, they have multi-packs. Um, there are a large number of vendors out there that uh, again, have face shields. But what you wanna make certain is that you don't overpay and that you can actually clean them and that the material won't break down. We've resorted to crafting where <laughs> we've actually made modified headbands and then we've taken some plexiglass, uh, flexible plexiglass to make our own face shields because face shields were again as rare as hen's teeth in the beginning and slowly the supply chain is picking up and the prices are indeed coming down. One of our attendees today would like to share the South Carolina heat map that you shared with us. Will they be able okay. to do that? They wanna share it with their team? I can do that. Uh, it's on the South Carolina website and I'll pull it up and okay. without destroying my, um, let me see if I can get over it. And I'll, I'll just post the URL into the chat box in a second. I'll take, you can ask another question while I get my mouse to cooperate. For Very some good. reason, I, it, the, there you. it goes. I had to get back to my website and pull it up. So okay. I'll look over here while you ask the question while I go try to find the, the heat map. There it is. Okay. And I know Shane, our president of the Mount Pleasant Chamber, you had a question as well before we close. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, again, thank you very much for uh, the great content today. I'm trying to use my inside voice as I speak to you right now, so thank you for that. Can you kind of walk us through what's the difference between this and the H1N1 of, uh, I guess that was 08, 09. You know, I, I don't even remember us really getting uh, in a fluster about H1N1, and, and that infected if I'm not mistaken, 30 million people and hundreds of thousands of folks that, that died. If I'm incorrect on that, please um, correct me. But it just seemed like H1N1 was a pretty big deal. And there wasn't, um, you know, the things that we're doing now for COVID, I don't remember any of that happening back, back then. What in your mind is the difference between this and that? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we had drugs that could actively stop the virus in its tracks for um, the H1N1. We had medications. They were in a short supply because there was a run on them, but we had medications that indeed worked. They were all FDA approved and we began to ramp up production. So we had medications that could, we could administer to the most sick and the most at risk. One of the things that you didn't hear about H1N1 is the urgent need for ventilators, like we heard this year for COVID. And the principal reason was, is we had uh, medications that could arrest further viral development. And secondly, we had the virus itself wasn't as virulent or cause as much disease in individuals that uh, the COVID-19 is having. This is a new virus that the human race has never seen before. And fundamentally, that's why it's causing so many problems. The other component as to why COVID-19 is far worse than influenza is the fact that of the receptor that the virus uses to get its instruction set into our cells. This receptor is ubiquitously distributed all through our bodies. There is not one organ in a human that is not susceptible to COVID-19. So as the virus multiplies, it not only infects our lungs that the flu virus typically only touches a lung, but it also knocks out our GI tract, and then it can also result in these bizarre symptoms of blood clots, strokes, and even diarrhea. It can cause intestinal disruption. And so this virus has got a whole different set of tricks than 
influenza did. We have been working on influenza for over 100 years since the great pandemic of the First World War, the Spanish flu, so to speak. And we've been actively learning about influenza and developing a strategy. In 100 years from now, COVID will seem like a joke to us in the sense that we will have really wrestled this beast to the ground to understand how we might fight it better. Right now, that's why the clinical trial about polio is so excited. And it effectively, the polio vaccine may be the equivalent of the ice bucket challenge. It may dump a bucket of ice on our immune system and say, hey folks, wake up. And if that indeed does bear fruit, we can vaccinate the entire population of the United States for less than $40 million. The polio, the live polio vaccine has a unit cost of 13 cents. So, and we know it's safe. Many of us have taken it and have had no ill effects. And in fact, polio was so affected, effective is in its oral form, we eliminated polio from the Western hemisphere. It's not in North and South America. You know, the Gates Foundation in concert with the Lions Club are actively trying to wipe polio from the face of the earth. And there are still a number of isolated pockets that the polio, the, where the live polio vaccine is still being used to try to combat that disease. So I'm hopeful that the scientific community will develop a strategy that will make this an afterthought in a few years. Excellent. Well, Dr. Schmidt, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Rebecca, any additional questions that you have? Um, actually, I had one about blood type. That's something I've been reading recently, Dr. Schmidt, about blood type. And I, you know, everyone is beginning to actively investigate blood typing. It appears individuals with type A blood are more susceptible. These are early days in that we only have a few number of manuscripts in the literature suggesting type A individuals um, are more at risk for developing serious disease. And the last week there was a paper about the HLA type, which is another marker on our tissues. And it was specifically associated with individuals of a particular tissue type. So that is actively being investigated by geneticists, immunologists, and people who are trying to understand how this virus causes this bizarre disease pattern. You know, some people like the congressman only lost this sense of taste and smell for a short period of time, while others are requiring a lung transplant subsequent to um, surviving a SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. We don't yet understand all the ins and outs, and that's what we're all actively pursuing uh, over the next few months, really trying to understand how this virus is causing all these bizarre symptoms in individuals. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schmidt. That's it from the chat room, Shane. Excellent. Well, Dr. Schmidt, thank you very much for uh, the content and the presentation. We really do appreciate your time and, uh, and your candor, and, and uh, we hope to uh, have you back again and uh, talking about the recovery from COVID-19. So thank you, sir, very much. Let's hope that's in a few weeks. Absolutely. That would be great. Well, thank, thank you, you again. Dr. Schmidt, it was uh, great to see you. Thanks for your content. I would like to um, leave the membership with one final thought before we go today. I came across, this is our motivational piece that we do before we end each meeting. I came across a piece titled, Why Me? Written by Barbara Vance. And I thought it was uh, apropos for, uh, for right now. If you have to ask why me, when you're feeling really blue, when the world is turned against you and you don't know what to do, when it pours colossal raindrops and the road's a winding mess, 
and you're feeling more confused than you could ever express. When the saddened sun won't shine, when the stars will not align, when you'd rather be inside your bed, the covers pulled above your head, when life is something that you dread and you have to ask, why me? Then when the world seems right and true, when rain has left a gentle dew, when you feel happy being you, please ask yourself, why me then too? We thank you very much for being here today. This was our second virtual monthly luncheon. Apologies for the technical difficulties with the audio, but we thank you for hanging in. Again, a thank you to Dr. Michael G. Schmidt for joining us today. And as always, be safe, stay healthy, keep moving forward. See you.